Apostle Peter, in just a few words, outlines all the major points of blood atonement in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 24 and 25. He said of Christ, that of his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned under the shepherd and bishop of your souls. There are four matters that we note in the lines that Peter has given in these two verses. It establishes the nature of atonement when he says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He establishes the need for atonement when he says, We, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, and then brings out the design of the matter by saying, by whose stripes ye are healed. And finally, he shows us the result when that he says, ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned under the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The doctrine of blood atonement is the vital doctrine centering on the cross that is the real core of the gospel of everlasting salvation. And the doctrine of blood atonement is attacked by the mind in the world quite severely. The critics even in what we term the theological realm have taken their attack upon blood atonement and have decided that God is not a wise God at all, else he could have saved man in some other way than demanding the bloody sacrifice, and particularly that of his own son, Jesus the Christ. But Peter, in these few words, brings out the enormous beauty of blood atonement, establishing, as we said, the nature of it, the design of it, the need of it, and the result of blood atonement. And we want to begin by looking at that first line in which he speaks of the nature of blood atonement. Just what is it, what does it involve, and so forth. And in that first line, in those first phrases, he says of Christ, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Blood atonement required a substitution for the death of man in sacrifice for sin. And these things date back to an early day of the prophets. We're quite familiar with Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. This is the chapter that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading in the 8th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles when the evangelist Philip joined himself to that chariot and began to discuss the subject of Christ and salvation with the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian was reading from Isaiah 53, short chapter of 12 verses, dealing with the entire scope of the coming of Jesus into this world, establishing that he is the Christ, that his mission was to die upon the cross. He would raise from the dead and ascend back to the glory of the realm of the Father. He would send forth his ambassadors, his chosen men, with the gospel of eternal redemption, and that his brethren would be numberless even though his seed line is cut short on this earth, and that by reason of his death. But we notice in the midsection of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, beginning in verse 4, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Man is shown to be the enemy of God, the culprit in the commission of the crime of sin, is guilty and is worthy of death. 
But God in his divine mercy and in an act of benevolence unknown by man and unheard of within the ranks of mankind sends his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to die in the flesh. He, Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. We needed the discipline. The punishment was rightly ours. Justice demanded that something be done to us, but God wounded his own son for our transgressions, bruised him for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The Old Testament time and again tells us that the men and the women of the ranks of wickedness cannot find peace, that they are a confused lot, that they are frustrated and they live in fear, that they are indeed, as we will note momentarily, those sheep that have gone astray. And there is much involved in that word astray that we will note coming to that part of our study tonight, but suffice it to say just now that those who are in the ranks of sin, crimes committed against God Almighty, in the realm of the wicked, the Bible says they have no peace. They may think they have peace by reason of material blessings or living a good life in this world. That is, from the standpoint of mammon or from the standpoint of a worldly life. They may think that they have things as they desire. They may indeed find much pleasure. But there is not an inner peace save that they have come to Jesus as Christ. Then they will come into that realm of peace. Now, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, Isaiah 53, verse 4 states. The chastisement of our peace, that is the disciplinary action necessary to bring about correction, whereby we will be related again to God or reconciled unto God, so making peace, only came through the chastisement that Jesus endured as a substitute for the punishment that we were to receive. And therefore, we have the word vicarious brought to mind. That is, the nature of blood atonement is that a substitute has to take the punishment that we deserve, and that is vicariousness. Another who is guiltless of the charge innocent of the crime, will now take the punishment in our stead or in our place. I read just the other day concerning a man who went to Tokyo at the turn of the century to preach the gospel. And when he came into Tokyo and through what we would term customs or the regulations necessary to enter the country, and get permission to stay there a while and do the work that he wanted to do, that the officer kept asking him, who stands in your place? And he didn't understand the meaning. He thought, well, he wants to see my visa. Showed him, no, who stands in your place? Well, he thought he needed other credentials authorizing him to be there uh, on proper grounds of authority. So he drew out all of the letters and all of the communications that had been uh, exchanged before that he entered the city of Tokyo. No, that isn't what they wanted either. Who stands in your place? A hundred years ago, people going into Tokyo would have to go through the city officials and find someone in Tokyo, a citizen of that city, who would stand in their place, the foreigner who was traveling in that land for an extended period of time. And the one standing in his place by the definition of the officer would do this, that if the foreigner or the alien visitor to that city committed any crime, his substitute, the one who was standing in his place, would pay for the crime. If there was a fine involved, he had to pay the fine. If there was imprisonment involved, that substitute had to go to jail. If the crime warranted death, the substitute would be put to death. Now, why were they doing that? What does it involve? 
It involves something that is related to this whole question of atonement for sin inasmuch as Jesus is the one standing in our place. The Christ of God stands in our place. We have committed the crime as we sojourn in the very realm of the sovereignty of God. We have committed the crime against God, His kingdom, His authority. We have usurped Him. We have transgressed God. But Jesus will stand in our place. Now, if someone traveling in a land, unless they are totally unscrupulous, if they're traveling in a foreign land and someone is standing in their place, how is it that anyone with any sensibility at all, any consciousness at all, any awareness for humanity at all, would do something that would cause another man to be responsible for the fine or to be put in prison for what I have done or to die for what I have done. And yet, when we look at it, this is what man worldwide has done. We have conducted ourselves in such a way that that one standing for us had to die. Jesus had to die. David anticipated these things in the Psalms. We're going to the 32nd Psalm. There in verses 1 and 2, prophetically looking to the day of Christ, David said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. We say David as anticipating the day of Christ because, first of all, the law did not have the power to cover transgressions and sins or remit them. Sin could not be covered. This word covered is a synonym to forgiveness or is a definitive term for the forgiveness of verse 1. If the transgressions are forgiven, the sins are covered. But the only way that the sin, indelible as sin is, can be forgiven is to be covered. That is, it is not erased, it is covered. The idea of forgiveness takes it out of the mind of God and it will not be held against us again. That is a certainty, but we need to be aware of the indelibleness of sin, how deep it goes into the heart and the soul and the conscience of man and woman, and even when that it is forgiven, it has only been covered. The blood has to cover it and take it out of sight. The blood of the Lord has to take it out of sight, out of the sight of God, out of the heart of man, in that sense, in that manner. But now note in verse 2, there is something even grander than the idea of the sin being forgiven or covered. First of all, it is that God will not impute that iniquity unto you and unto me, because he's going to impute it unto the Lord, in that one in whom there is no God. We know that because this is the use that Paul makes of David's statement in the third chapter of Romans. In the third chapter of Romans, we're going down to verse 23. And Paul says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say. Now the word declare, that's a declaration. That is a pronouncement by one in authority to announce that something has been done by authority. Judicially, by legal authority, a declaration or a pronouncement has been made, and that pronouncement is that at this time the righteousness of God uh, the, 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 to declare at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So the declaration has been made in Romans 3 and 25 by God that he is able of redeeming man or justifying man by grace but only through the fact that his son died on the cross, shedding his blood, offering the propitiation unto God for our sin. 
Now, when God is propitiated for my sin, He is satisfied with the sacrifice that has been made with the intent of removing that sin. Therefore, He forgives that sin. He forgives that sin. And Paul, in this third chapter then, quotes from the prophecy of David in the 32nd chapter and says that he will not impute that iniquity unto man because he has imputed it unto the Lord. If he has imputed the, by the very nature of atonement, the imputation is that he has imputed sin, our sins, he has given the account of our sins, or imputed meaning reckoning, God has reckoned our sins unto Jesus Christ. He did that in order that Christ might die unto sin, as we have it in Romans chapter 6. That he, bear, that he was bearing the burden of our sin there. And by reckoning our sins, by reckoning our sins on Christ, he has not imputed them unto us. Had he imputed our sins unto ourselves, we would have had to have died to be redeemed from sin. As we noted before, if we die for our own sins, literally, we will die in our sins because we're not capable of offering a sacrifice even of our own life for the remission of our sins. The nature of atonement. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, that he in the likeness of sinful flesh died for sin in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, since Jesus has taken on our sin, our sin has been imputed or reckoned unto Christ. The nature of the atonement is that he now dies in sin, and we receive righteousness, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, in him in him and in declare state and relationship therefore when that it is that each christian has obeyed the gospel and been baptized into christ as an outgrowth of their faith baptized into christ they are in him they have therefore been romans 6 baptized into his death and baptized into his death we become dead unto our sins for he has carried them to the cross so he bear our sins to the cross now let's go back to Peter. 1 Peter, the second chapter, and verses 24 and 25. We see, we have seen or looked at in part at the nature of atonement. Now the second phrase is brought to bear. That we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness. Word we want there is the design of atonement. The design of atonement. First of all, that it is that we being dead to sins. The design has a twofold application or connection. First of all, being made dead to sin is punitive. That we should live under righteousness is remedial. That is, there is going to be punishment meet out for the sin. And we are made dead unto sin. We will then be raised in the very birth of Jesus Christ or in regeneration to new life as new creatures and we should live unto righteousness. If you will use the first half dozen verses of the sixth chapter of Romans as a parallel to these two verses, in the second chapter of 1 Peter, you're going to find an interesting study. They are parallel. And Paul, in one instance, Romans 6, is developing these same lessons in a little different manner, but he's coming to the same conclusion following the same pattern. He uses entirely different language than Peter, and yet the principles involved are identical that it is that it was required by the very nature of sin that someone die in our stead for the remission of sins and the design of the doctrine of blood atonement, the death of Jesus on the cross, 
is first of all punitive, that is the punishment will be meet out for sin, we died under sin, then it is remedial or there's going to be a recovery of spiritual health and that will have to be through living unto righteousness having been raised from the waters of baptism. In Romans 6, Paul says we rise to walk in newness of life as he did, as Christ did. We rise to walk in a newness of life. So that is the design of it. It's one thing to die unto sin. It is another thing to live under righteousness. And it takes both of these in balance to bring about the Christian life. Not enough to just be born again in the forgiveness of sins. It is now essential that we live the life that Jesus Christ has pointed toward in the Christian system. So we have died unto sin. Paul says in the Romans letter that when we have died unto sin, it has no more hold over us. It has no leverage whatsoever. If we've died unto sin, we are indeed dead unto sin. And the act of faith, repentance, and baptism brings about the perfection of that death unto sin. We appropriate it from Christ. He died literally under sin, and death now holds nothing over him, and sin holds nothing over him whatsoever. Again, using a physical and a civil illustration, suppose that a man commits murder, and the court system dictate that they will put that man to death. He will be executed for the murder. And he is executed for the murder. Then suppose, getting hypothetical now, but in order to bear out the parallel and bring the illustration to a point that is proper, suppose that that man who has committed murder and has been executed for his crime then raises from the dead. Can the courts judge him for that crime again and execute him again? No. No. Jesus died under sin. He arose from the dead, so death did not have power over him. He cannot now be accused and tried or executed again for the crime of sin. That's why the bloody sacrifice of Jesus was a one-for-all-time sacrifice never to be engaged again. He died under sin. He took away the barrier of sin. Then it is when we individually are baptized into Christ Jesus, into that system of atonement, then it is that our personal sins will put that in the plural. When Jesus died, he died under sin, that is, took away the barrier of sin by removing the power of Satan over sin, taking that authority away in the Lord's resurrection from the dead. But now it is when we come into his death, being baptized into his death, baptized into his blood, our own sins are now remitted. And we are dead to sin. We have died to sin. And if I have died to something and raised to walk in a new life, I should let that life be as pure and as holy in the state of righteousness as I am capable of making it to be. Make it to be as pure and as holy as I possibly can make it. So he says, you're dead to sin. You should live under righteousness. The third term is, there is a need for this atonement. And that's seen in the next phrases as we drop on in the study of verses 24 and 25, 1 Peter chapter 2. For we are, or ye were, as sheep going astray. Ye are sheep going astray. He likens us to sheep. The Bible speaks of the ox knowing its own master and the ass knowing the place of its own crib. It's true that with most animals in this world, that should they become separated from their home place, from their crib or from their master, they will find their way back. Stories have been amazing about dogs and cats and various animals finding their way back from hundreds and hundreds of miles distance in a strange place, lost 
would find their way back. But the sheep cannot do that. It is the one animal that cannot. The sheep that is without the shepherd goes astray without single exception. Sheep cannot lead themselves, and if found without the shepherd, they will wander further in frustration and confusion away from their master or shepherd. They have to have the shepherd. The man in sin is as sheep going astray. The Greek language is far more expressive and vivid than the English language. The term used for astray carries, of course, the idea of astray, but it carries two or three other things. It means astray, and it means that they are astray because they are confused, and it means that they are confused possibly to the point of mental aberration, that they cannot think clearly, that they see things in a different light than reality will allow. They are mentally deficient in the sense that they cannot function mentally on proper principles. There is an aberration, and that is the confusion. And there's a fourth term that relates to it in the Greek, and that is that they have been seduced or deceived. And when we begin to study the subject of sin in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, in writing to Timothy and touching on the origin of sin, the beginning of sin, in Adam and in Eve, says there is a difference in the type of sin that Adam and Eve committed, and that it is that Eve had been seduced. She had been deceived. And when we study sin from the Old Testament standpoint again, we gain a definition from the day of Moses when it is said that he would rather suffer with his own people than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, which means that sin presents itself seductively as a pleasurable matter and therefore deceives, leading men into the commission of sin, promising far more than it can possibly deliver. It misrepresents itself entirely. So going astray is going astray, involving confusion to the point of mental aberration, not being able to think clearly. As long as you're without that shepherd, you need some assistance. Was it not so that the Ethiopian said to Philip, when Philip acquired, do you understand what you're reading? That the Ethiopian said, how can I accept some man should guide me? There has to be the leading, the teaching, out of the darkness of sin. And that's the role of the church. That's the role of Christian men and women show the light that leads out from the darkness of sin. And then there is that fourth word, seduction or deception. They're led astray. And thus they become fugitives against God. And isn't this what it was, what came to pass in the day of Cain? When Cain slew Abel in the beginning, because Cain's sacrifice was not accepted and Abel's was, and although God came to Cain and literally begged him, pleaded with him to go back and do the sacrifice again, doing it right, doing it faithfully, Cain would not, Cain did not, and rather in envy and in jealousy went out and murdered his brother Abel, and Cain was then marked and became a vagabond, fugitive, a fugitive against God wandering aimlessly, wandering aimlessly, frustrated and confused. Notice the mental aberration. He is astray, and he has seduced himself in this entire matter. The deception is of his own doing, because God has been there appealing to him. Man has gone astray. The result of the atonement is seen then in the last phrase. The result of the atonement, and that is that you have returned. Returned. Return to the bishop, the shepherd of your soul. Returned unto the shepherd and bishop 
of your soul. Return. It's an interesting word. How can you return to the bishop and shepherd of your soul if you had never been with it? If we are born into this world totally depraved by heredity, if original sin is a true doctrine and we are born in sin, of Satan, the devil, and not of God in innocency. If we are born totally depraved and not innocent, born totally depraved means we are not part of the fellowship of God. We are not in the realm of His grace if we are totally depraved. And this simple word return establishes that the doctrine born of Calvin's ability, that man is hereditarily, totally depraved to the narrow. Because if we return to the bishop of our souls, which admittedly is Christ, it means that we have been in the beginning in fellowship with him. Yes, we're born into this world innocent. We are born into this world free of sin. We are made in the image of God. We are the children of God by creation, physically. But then when we sin, the separation comes. And then when we return, we return to the innocency of that original relationship we had with God by forgiveness of our sins in the atonement. And when we return unto him who is the bishop of our souls and the shepherd of our souls, now it is that this matter of being astray will be corrected. For we as sheep now have a shepherd to whom we have returned, and we will no longer go astray in the event that we will cling to him. Come unto me, he said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. We said earlier that the wicked are mentioned in the Bible time and again as not having peace, not being in peace. They are astray. They are confused. They cannot find peace till they come to Jesus. Come unto me, he said. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. That's peace. That's peace in this text. And it's the only place it can be found. And Paul says, it is the peace that passeth understanding. The peace that passeth understanding. We want to make the same call. Come to Jesus. Not to us. Not to us. Come to Jesus. Find the Lord. Obey Him. And be refreshed in the peace of the forgiveness of sins. In the peace filled with the hope of life eternal. We're subject to his call. Why not tonight? While we stand, while we sing.